Fantastic. Well, let's let's make a start. Um, firstly, uh, a good morning to everyone here, and uh, I know we've got uh, a lot of colleagues online as well. A good morning from Kyoto to them, wherever they may be joining us. Um, it's it's a real privilege for me to be moderating this session today. My name is Kambor Sainbor. I'm the head of the Democratic Governance and Media Freedom Department of the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. We have a wonderful panel here today with you. I'm going to ask them each to introduce themselves when I hand them over to the floor to engage in this session. I'll start off with making a few introductory remarks to set the scene, as it were. Um, from the UK's perspective, um, it's a real privilege for us for this year as part of the Freedom Online Coalition to be chairing one of the task forces of the Freedom Online Coalition, in this case, the Task Force on Internet Shutdowns. And true to the multi-stakeholder spirit of the IGF, we're delighted to be chairing that with the FOC Advisory Network members, Access Now, and the Global Network Initiative. We are chairing this task force because we passionately believe that internet shutdowns pose a significant threat to the free flow of information. They are a significant threat to the ability of everyone to express themselves online. They are a major source of censorship. And as all of you know, in a world where we are increasingly exercising our offline offline rights online, they are a fundamental impediment to the ability of us to exercise our human rights. In that regard, we want to use our task force chairship to highlight the increasing prevalence and use of shutdowns and internet disruptions. And we passionately believe that the multi-stakeholder approach is the right one. But we also recognize that internet shutdowns need to be seen as part of a much broader set of issues, all of which are related. For example, we have the issue of media freedom, online violence against women, development, mis- and disinformation. All of them come together to pose a significant threat to the ability of all of us to exercise our rights and actually lead to the full exercise of uh, the, r the realization of development. So in that regard, I want to briefly, before I hand over to the panel, highlight for the benefit of all of you that the there has been a joint statement on internet shutdowns and elections which is actually going live today. Um, so if you have a look at the screen, um, we have a quick uh, snapshot of this statement, the first issued by the FOC. In that regard, I think it's a great way to introduce the session today, a reminder of the determination of the FOC to take up the challenge that this issue poses. Um, for all of you in the room, and I hope for all of you online, you can see the statement now. Um, we will share a copy of that later. I'm very happy to uh, discuss that as well during the Q&A. So in so far as <coughs> today's session is concerned, we've got, I think, five speakers. I'm going to ask them each to come in, firstly, with a few words of self-introduction, and then they'll spend about three or five minutes reflecting on a particular point of this session. And then we will have I hope a good half an hour or so of discussion where we can answer questions or reflect on any points that you in the room or virtually are making. So without any further ado, I'm going to ask Felicia Antonio to start off and give a reflection on the Keep It On campaign and what those some of the initial recommendations for policymakers are. So. Over to you, Felicia. Hello, can you hear me okay? All right. Um, 
I'm Felicia Antonio, Keep It On Campaign Manager at Access Now. And for those who don't know what the Keep It On Campaign is, um, it's a global campaign that unites over 300 organizations around the world. And our objective is to fight internet shutdowns. And this campaign was launched in 2016 by Access Now and other stakeholders. And since then, we've monitored, documented, and advocated against shutdowns globally. So um, for the purpose of today's um, session, I'm going to give a few highlights of what we've seen across the globe with regards to shutdowns in general, and then I'll narrow my submission to election-related shutdowns and the impact. So according to our data and monitoring that is Access Now and the Keep It On Coalition, um, internet shutdowns are spreading, they are lasting longer, and they are also impacting lives. Um, since 2016, we've documented at least 1,200 incidents of shutdowns in about 76 countries worldwide. And these incidents of shutdowns are usually perpetrated by governments, um, state actors, warring parties, military junters, or third parties. And they take place during very critical moments like elections, protests, and conflict situations. In relation to shutdowns documented around elections, we have seen at least 57 election-related shutdowns globally since 2016. Africa accounts for 44% of these shutdowns. Um, that is about 25 of these shutdowns um, happened in Africa. We also have countries like Iran, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Iraq, Belarus, Turkmenistan, among others that have weaponized shutdowns during elections. Um, we all know and believe that the internet and digital platforms continue to enable and enhance fundamental human rights of people to access information, to express themselves, and to also um, uh, enjoy their rights to freedom of assembly. And so in times of elections, the internet plays a critical role in promoting free, transparent, and fair electoral process by providing political candidates avenues to reach their supporters or audience, as well as allow equal access to communication channels for both the incumbent and the um, opposition to debate and highlight their political manifestos and policies. And for voters, keeping the internet and essential platforms on during elections enable them to actively participate in democratic processes scrutinize policies put forward by political candidates and also provide opportunities for people to hold their governments to account. Elections, particularly in growing democracies, are a critical time of transition and active participation in the process contributes significantly to, the critic, to, the credible, the, to a credible democratic outcome. Journalists, human rights defenders, election observers, and other key stakeholders also rely on the internet and digital communication tools to monitor the electoral process. And shutdowns make it extremely difficult for all these actors to effectively um, monitor the electoral processes um, across the globe. Some governments have attempted to justify these shutdowns as relevant to prevent the spread of misinformation or hateful content, or as a national security measure. However, the opposite is true. When you shut down the internet during elections, it's, it results in chaos, in the sense that it blocks alternative sources of information verification channels and seeks to benefit only the incumbent governments. Imposing shutdowns during elections is likely to also agitate people to protest and um, in, in, in that regard, it questions the national security bit of governments trying to justify shutdowns. And according to a study that was done in 2019 by the collaboration of ICT policy in East and Southern Africa, shutdowns remain a go-to tool for governments who want to hold on to power. With examples in Uganda, Belarus, Republic of Congo, and most recently we saw um, this happened in Gabon when um, the internet was shut down and then the incumbent was um, announced as the winner of the elections 
but um, the, there was a military coup which overthrew him. And so if that hadn't happened, we would have the incumbents um, in power um, for the next um, term of elections. And then I think that um, although the number of elections around the world have reduced over the past few years, with um, some authorities in countries like Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, among others, making commitments to keep it on during elections, I think it still remains a crucial priority for all actors working to advance democracy around the world. And so next year we have, uh, or next year has been described as the year of elections with at least 50 or so elections, um, 50 or so, or so countries scheduled to go to the polls. And so given the direct inf um, interference of shutdowns on electoral processes and the outcomes of elections, I think it's important for all stakeholders, including um, governments, regional and international bodies like the United Nations, the African Union, European Union, um, the Freedom Online Coalition, among others, to support the Keep It On Coalition other stakeholders and other stakeholders to ensure that governments do not normalize shutdowns during elections. And we welcome the just published um, statements by the Freedom Online Coalition denouncing election related shutdowns. And um, my other recommendation also goes to the businesses and telecom um, companies as well as big tech companies um, to ensure that people have access to secure, open, free, inclusive internet access throughout electoral um, um, processes, as well as um, ensure that these platforms are safe for people to be able to express themselves. And to also um, avoid giving governments reasons to justify their actions by shutting down the internet. So in conclusion, I think that the fight against shutdowns um, requires a collaborative effort, as we've seen. Um, and so this is not just something that civil society alone is working on, we've seen um, the just um, released um, statement by the Freedom Online Coalition, as well as statements denouncing um, the use of shutdowns by several governments and other institutions, which we appreciate as um, the Keep It On Coalition, and we look forward to working with all of you um, to push back against shutdowns. Thank you. Thank you very much, Felicia, for that really great overview of the elections and shutdowns. I'm now very pleased to hand over to our colleague joining us on, uh, on, sc on screen, Andrea Ngombe, who will reflect on the impact of shutdowns on the ground, especially as seen from the Republic of Congo. So over to Andrea. Me? Can you can you hear us? Can Andrea? you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can hear yeah, you. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, we can okay. hear you. Please continue. Thank you. Okay. Let me start the video. Okay, it's okay. So, uh, thanks for having me. I'm Andrea Gombe from Republic of Congo, leader of uh, Sasufi Collective, which is an organization based in Paris, but working on democracy and human rights in the Republic of Congo. We started just for human rights and democracy, and then we extend in many topics as anti-kleptocracy, and we really work with Keep it on campaign since 2015. So uh, what happened in the last election in 2021 in Congo was not just informative, but it follow up what uh, Felicia said. The narrative first is about safety, the safety of the public against foreign interference, against misinformation coming from the opposition, but never about the misinformation coming from the government, of course. And by using this narrative of uh, fighting the foreign influence into in interference into the electoral process, they are able to sell the internet shutdown as something as, oh, we are so weak. We are a weak democracy. We don't have a tool to keep the internet on because we don't have the necessary tool to to block that misinformation. And during that election, it was surprising that this narrative was even effective in the public opinion, general public opinion of the Congolese. And it goes on for about one week without phone and internet because 
were just not block the internet, they also block uh, the telecommunication uh, directly in the country. And uh, with that narrative, they extended to the anti-terrorist activity. And uh, my point here is to say that this internet shutdown is not just for the internet, it's also have impact directly on the people. Because of this new anti-terrorist and cyber criminality law in Congo, they are able to uh, arrest uh, militants from the opposition because of social media posts. Even if the internet was blocked, if you post something earlier about the election process, they can go and arrest you. And, and uh, three uh, activists from the opposition were arrested and put in jail for about three or four months uh, because of uh, this internet shutdown and the information they, 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 they spread. And on our side, as Sophie, and this is what I, I, I was trying to make as a point, we work with people from Meta to say that during election time in Africa, because of the behavior of our government, they need to step up. I don't ask for a full and permanent uh, task for on election, but during election time, because of the spread of hate speech from the opposition and from the government, something someone needs to be in the middle and and like a referee for the competition on the free flow of information. And we were able to secure a tacit way to work with Meta and they put up something called uh, Congo Fact Check to check on the information putting out during that special time. And they were able to block a very vast uh, disinformation coming, coming from government related uh, Facebook account. And it was really shameful for the government to come up with this idea of blocking misinformation by shutting down internet and being themselves broke because they use robot and and bot to spread lies during election time so this is what was happening and because of that i also think that the next move of this international town in africa is not just about internet shutdown it's about control control of the information coming in the country so because they are not able to have the, the, the newest technology they use the internet shutdown but in the coming years and in the perspective of Congo Brazzaville, they are trying to have a set of tools coming from the Republic of China, uh, people of Republic of China, so they can have this kind of firewall and secure themselves from any kind of information coming from outside the world, inside the country. So this is what we need to be focused on, not just the regular internet shutdown, but this next step they are trying to make to block any kind of information coming from, from outside, inside the country. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Andrea, for that really powerful reflection on the ground, especially some of those future challenges. Also, thank you for staying on time, and a special thanks for joining us. I think it's one o'clock where you are in Paris, so we're very grateful that you've dialed in. Uh, very, uh, much, much obliged. I'm now gonna hand over to Ben Graham Jones, to reflect on shutdowns and freedom of expression. Thanks ever so much, uh, Kamba, and thank you other colleagues. Uh, my name's Ben Graham Jones. I am an ele elections consultant, work on many elections every year, uh, and an advisor to the Westminster Foundation for Democracy, a UK public body. Uh, let me start by applauding the joint statement on internet shutdowns and elections by the Freedom Online Coalition. I think it really provides a, a sound basis for calling out the illegitimacy uh, of internet shutdowns, wherever they may occur. I'm gonna make three brief points uh, today, and really the first is, is that I would like to, um, I'd like you to imagine, if you would, a situation where you have an election, and at some point during the election process, perhaps um, on election day, or perhaps as the results are being counted and tabulated, 10,000, okay, 10,000, journalists are locked up by government authorities. How, how, uh, how much condemnation and opprobrium this would attract from the international community and from domestic actors, and rightly so. And yet it strikes me that when 
the communications of an entire population is silenced for that period, there is not always the same level and the same degree of condemnation. And perhaps we need to think carefully about how we can equate those two events that the legitimacy of the rights that we enjoy offline are in no way diminished when they are online. And so this is the first point I wish to make. That equality between the rights we have offline as they are online, it's been agreed at the UN General Assembly. It's something which I think we need to underscore, and I applaud the work of Access Now, of NDI, of other partners here today uh, who do such uh, excellent job in really raising awareness uh, of that fact. Of course, internet shutdowns are not just about um, about the right to freedom of expression. And the second point I would like to make pertains to disinformation, okay, the right to access information, and uh, the right to credible elections, all of which depend on having that basis of fact-based information. And one of the things that you know, I see as, a, as someone who specializes in counter disinformation is that when internet shutdowns occur, they amplify disinformation. How do they amplify disinformation? Because they concentrate the sources of information that people can access. You know, state TV, for example, may remain on, or it may be that the, the, the channels that are closed down or the means which are throttled uh, are selective. And so what, what that means for those of us working in counter disinformation is that we need to be thinking seriously about pre-bunking, about moving our response efforts to prevention efforts, to mitigation efforts, about providing fact-based information at an earlier stage of the process where there is a risk of internet shutdowns. I want to very briefly suggest four actions that can help in that regard. Number one, when we're working in, in contexts which may be vulnerable to internet shutdowns, we need to learn from other contexts. You know, if, you are, if you're sat there in an election commission in um, you know, uh, Nigeria, let's say, you may not be thinking about the recent election that took place in you know, Kenya or France or you know, Kazakhstan, your previous points of reference is probably the previous elections that took place in Nigeria. <laughs> um, but actually what we need to be bearing in mind is that we see quite a lot of overlap in the types of disinformation narratives that are circulated across different electoral contexts. You know, I see this, I work globally across lots of different elections each year. And so by looking at other contexts, we can bolster preparedness for counter disinformation in advance of any internet shutdown and information monopoly being uh, imposed. The second thing uh, is to think about narrative forecasting. Our organizations, whether it's election management bodies, civil society organizations, political parties, really making a, a, a plan for thinking about what types of narratives might be deployed at different points in the process, informed by that international best practice, and then thinking about what a response might look like. Thirdly, overcoming selection bias. We know that people don't seek out counter disinformation. We know people don't look to, to check whether or not their pre-existing opinion is correct. There's, there's decades of psychological research on this. And so we need to find ways of bringing that fact-based information before shutdowns occur uh, into the places where it needs to be because the very people who will otherwise seek out fact-based information are precisely the, the people who you need to reach least. And fourth, thinking about uh, drafting that preemptive response early. You know, if you can draft well, if you can draft um, effective infographics and videos uh, to counter some of these narratives uh, early on, then when they do come up, it's going to reduce your response times and cut the virality of disinformation before any shutdowns are imposed. Uh, the third point uh, I'd like to very briefly make uh, is on risk forecasting. And when we're thinking about internet shutdowns, by the time it takes place, often it's, uh, it's too late to do a lot of the actions that can have substantive consequence, whether that's the publication of telecommunications licensing agreements, whether that's um, putting concerted pressure, um, the sorts of things that the, the Keep It On um, coalition does so, so effectively. Uh, and so we really need to be thinking about, uh, on a sector-wide basis, but also within our individual organizations, um, mapping out risks. So for example, if you're a body that sends election observation missions, you might be thinking about, okay, were our known risk factors of internet shutdowns present in particular contexts and then prioritizing the deployment of your missions to those places so that you can serve as a, um, as a, as a counterweight to the monopolization of information. 
Likewise, if you are a civil society organization whose communications plan depends on releasing a statement around election day, but you realize that there is a chance of an internet shutdown, then maybe you need to think a little bit carefully about how to communicate your key messaging around the election if that's not going to be possible. So three key points, remembering that the same rights online apply offline, thinking about far-sighted disinformation response, and forecasting risk. Thanks ever so much. Thank you very much, Ben, especially for those really practical recommendations as well. We're now going to go back online. We've got a colleague joining us, uh, Nicole Stremlow, who will reflect on the research on government decisions around internet shutdown, especially in Africa. Over to you, Nicole. Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me. We can. We can. Please continue. Thank you. Okay, okay great. Thank you so much. So I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to reflect on some of the research we've been doing at Oxford around internet shutdowns, and particularly around elections and conflicts, primarily in Africa. So we've been conducting some research on government decision making. So basically asking why governments are choosing this relatively blunt tool of internet shutdowns as compared with other forms of control. Um, and specifically in Ethiopia, and I just returned from Ethiopia, we've been also been looking at the impact um, in the perception of shutdown in violence affected communities. And actually like Andrea, we found sort of a growing acceptance or acquiescence that this is an, actually an important tool. Um, and in the process of our research, we've also sought to come up with a different reading of internet shutdowns. So to look beyond this framing, this dichotomy of digital authoritarianism, and ask whether or not it's possible to identify these alternative logics and rules rather than the assumed motivations of what's actually driving shutdowns. And I also have three points, like my previous colleague. Um, and I would say, first of all, a somewhat obvious point is that we're seeing a growing acceptance of shutdowns. So they're becoming increasingly normalized as a tool to address very legitimate con concerns around election interference, concerns about disinformation, concerns about incitement to violence post-elections. And they're seen as a useful tool or a necessary trade-off to protect the integrity of the electoral process. And by this, I'm talking about a lot of reflections around the research we've been doing on the ground. Um, in Africa. So I think it's also helpful to remember that there's long been information controls around elections in different democracies. So the banning of public opinion polls within weeks of election is seen in Kenya, the prohibition of political advertising or campaign rallies close to voting day that might arise in particular contexts in accordance with historical experiences. And the challenge of social media is that it's making um, it makes imposing these kinds of silences around elections increasingly difficult. So shutdowns are this blunt tool, this very crude tool for addressing some of these concerns in the context of having less precise tools or not knowing what else to do um, that might historically have been available for dealing with concerns around mass media, for example. And second, I think most importantly, we see shutdowns as a growing form of resistance, an expression of frustration to the overwhelming power of large social media companies that are typically based in the US or China. And, um, and we see this, this, this frustration with the failures and the inequalities of online content moderation. And I think to some degree, this has become well-documented. People have been um, writing about this and doing research about this, particularly around the failure of online content moderation in local African languages and the lack of attention given to resource poor communities. So we see governments in these more marginal markets in the global South being frustrated with this inadequate response, the, in the lack of engagement, the lack of pro product oversight from these large tech companies. And so shutdowns are seen by some, and it's not always explicit, but as a way of expressing sovereignty, as a way of pushing back against what is often seen to be these arbitrary responses of incredibly rich companies deciding good and bad actors from a distance, and the frustration also with the rules that are being written in far-off countries according to certain logics that local authorities feel powerless to engage or really to challenge. And so like Andrea, you know, I agree there's a lot of discussion and debate about what more can these companies do, not necessarily in Kenya, but more in the Central African Republic, for example, or the failures of what's been happening in Ethiopia. And third, I think we've also seen that the decision to implement shutdowns partly is an information literacy challenge. And I think to some degree, this has been overlooked, 
But our research has shown that governments often resort to shutdowns because of a lack of experience of how to actually engage these large tech companies or a lack of understanding about alternative ways of, of addressing the very legitimate concerns about the failures of online content moderation, particularly around elections or in cases of extreme violence. And how, how to, to navigate this balance between the competing rights, such as the responsibility to protect in cases of extreme violence, as well as freedom of expression or the right to information, as we've mentioned on this panel already. And if I can say a very tiny plug, um, we at Oxford, we were just awarded a European Media and Information Fund Award to actually launch a new program to train policymakers and judges through a new executive program on information literacy. And we're specifically going to be working on how to improve understanding among these key influencers on how to address these really very real challenges that information disorder poses, uh, particularly in the context of generative, generative AI, but really how to do so through a human's rights, through a human rights framework ahead of elections in context of extreme violence, and hopefully reducing the need or the turn towards these blunt, crude tools of censorship that internet shutdowns are. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole. Really helpful there, and also grateful for you joining us. I know it's a uh, difficult time zone where you are as well. Um, we're now going to go to our last speaker. Uh, that's Sarah Moulton. Before we open it up to you, uh, the audience for Q&A, uh, Sarah will be reflecting on the multi-stakeholder coordination challenge. Uh, over to you, Sarah. Thanks. Um, my name is Sarah Moulton. I'm from the National Democratic Institute. I'm the deputy director of our democracy and technology team. NDI is a nonprofit, nonpartisan, non-governmental organization based in the U.S., uh, but we work in about 50 countries around the world. And we come at this um, from an implementation angle. Um, you know, NDI works and supports uh, democratic processes, strengthening democratic institutions, and provides a lot of on-the-ground election support uh, for many of the elections that have been discussed already. Um, but and primarily, we do a lot of work with um, domestic observation groups, independent groups on the ground who are deployed in advance of an election um, to report back on you know, what they're seeing at the polling station and reporting on the process and the results. And obviously, for us, from a practical standpoint, um, it's really important for the internet to be working so that they can transmit uh, their findings and what they're seeing throughout the day and then allowing the um, observer group to then report on, uh, make a statement about the process that they're seeing and you know, hopefully verify uh, that it was indeed uh, democratic and uh, properly run. That's not always the case. Um, however, you know, what we're seeing often uh, these days is that these disruptions are uh, making it more challenging for uh, groups on the ground to do so. Um, there's definitely been a lot more uh, concern about what might be happening and trying to plan in advance for uh, potential shutdowns. Um, and so one thing that we've really explored is how do we better utilize this network, uh, which can often include thousands, uh, you know, maybe up to 2,000 in some cases, observers deployed uh, in all parts of a country, and how do we um, take advantage of that distribution in order to collect better data on what we're seeing um, across country in terms of whether there's a shutdown, whether there's just a disruption, or there's throttling, uh, perhaps censorship of particular particular sites um, that can lead to better data collection on that process. So how can we feed that data um, to the wider network of stakeholders that we've been talking about? Um, this is, you know, our topic here is multi-stakeholder collaboration. Um, and how do we share that data with those who can perhaps do that more direct advocacy um, with individuals maybe across on a, at an international level, but also even domestically? Um, our concern with that particular group um, Obviously, there's higher risks to observers uh, these days. We've been seeing uh, in a couple of recent examples, uh, Sierra Leone uh, and perhaps uh, Zimbabwe is the more uh, <laughs> difficult one to talk about. Um, but the, you know, seeing uh, observers arrested for simply the process that they're doing, an independent uh, analysis and verification, um, sometimes in the middle of what they're doing uh, on election day, in the case of Zimbabwe. And so we have to look at, you know, how do we protect these groups who can collect this data, um, but also enable them to 
to do so because there's a lot of opportunity, there's a lot of tools out there now, um, you know, uh, in order to take these measurements and then report them up. The other thing, like sort of the other side of this angle is NDI also works with politicians and policymakers, and I think that there's a real opportunity for collaboration here, uh, but really needing to do so well in advance uh, of an election. We need to get this process started um, now, yesterday, um, you know, especially with 2024. We've been talking about 2024 for years now, but, you know, when are we, you know, we really have to actually start working towards it. This statement is a great, um, is a great start and a great recognition of that coming up. And I know, you know, thanks to, you know, Keep It On campaign really um, puts a lot of effort into planning and tracking which elections are going to be, um, you know, perhaps the most uh, significant in potential for uh, shutdowns. But also reflecting, uh, having just come from uh, the, FIFA Africa uh, event in uh, Tanzania last week, I think, um, that, uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, I think, interest from policymakers to engage in this process, but there's also a lack of information at times. There's a lack of understanding of the environment, and sometimes the approach from civil society might potentially be aggressive in this, and they perceive it as that we are not being collaborative, um, that we are coming at them as opposed to working together with them. And um, frankly, sometimes there's uh, a challenge in trying to get policymakers to care about the issue. Um, there's, you know, the, the prospect of freedom of expression may not really resonate, uh, especially when it came up, um, the reference Felicia made to national security is often an argument made, um, but I think really where we can make a, a difference here is really the impact of a shutdown beyond that. It's, you know, looking at the, um, you know, healthcare issues. It's looking at um, uh, economic loss, like it has a huge impact uh, on a country and really trying to, you know, collect that data, use the data that we're collecting in order to make that case, in order to work earlier on with not only politicians or individuals, but political parties generally, because politicians during the time of an election are really concerned more <laughs> about their election than they are about, you know, potentially a shutdown. So how can you work with the wider, you know, political party ecosystem? And I think there's things we can do in preparation of that. You know, there is a desire um, for training programs, for uh, learning about these tools, for working together with um, multi-stakeholder uh, approaches, whether that's civil society or others. Um, and I think for us, if we can make better efforts to uh, connect civil society with uh, political parties as also international initiatives uh, that we can go a long way towards um, kind of mitigating this potential damage that's coming up. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Sarah. Really, really helpful. Um, we're now going to open it up for Q&A, really. Um, I want to start with folks in the room first. If you can briefly introduce yourself and also briefly set out your comment or, or question, that would be great. I think the format is, I see a mic in the middle, so um, maybe uh, we've got a colleague already there. If you could, uh, the, the gentleman in the white shirt, if you could uh, start off. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Eugene Morozov, and I represent uh, DevoteUSA.com a voting solution. I want to thank this panel for bringing up uh, two very important components of free and fair elections, and one is availability of communication. You talk about internet, but there are, of course, other ways to communicate, like uh, GSM networks or blockchain networks, which do not use TCP IP protocol at all. Then you talked about something also very important, and that is availability of independent observers and um, uh, journalists and international organizations, very important. But there are three other critical components on free and fair elections, which this panel have not touched upon, so I just wanted to raise them. Um, one of them is uh, true immutability of election results, and that is achieved uh, by, for example, using uh, blockchain, which is what we, we use. Uh, then, of course, um, there is uh, an issue of security and safety, and that is achieved by using uh, cryptographic uh, protection. And you also need um, scalable networks uh, to conduct elections with a country, let's say, with 300 million voters, right? You must have scalable um, uh, network to conduct those. So my question is, 
uh, are there any thoughts to those other components of free and fair election process that this panel is thinking about? And if not, of course, come uh, talk to us. We can help. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Eugene. Uh, some really powerful reflections there on the wider technological context of elections. I'm going to look to the panel in the room first to see if anyone wants to respond to Eugene. Um, and uh, ben, Ben's volunteered. Ben, over to you. Sure, thanks, Eugene. I mean, I, I don't. Want, I want to keep us uh, close to the remit on on internet shutdowns, but just to say that I think there's probably you know, two components to electoral legitimacy, isn't there? There's the actual process itself and how that pans out, and then there's the perception of the process and uh, election technology. Um, is a classic target for disinformation, um, in part because it's very difficult to explain um, your know, blockchain or to explain um, you, know, you can't observe electrons and, as well, and so, so it, it makes it quite tricky sometimes. You know, of course, there are, there are big tools for building confidence, like risk limiting audits, like cryptographic m methods as well. Um, but I think that's exactly why it's so important that we fight internet shutdowns, uh, is because when you've got that sort of disinformation that can be levied against election technologies, in particular. Um, then you can't actually fight that if the fact checkers and the journalists don't have uh, the ability to do so. Great, thank you. We have another speaker now. Over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, Nikki Miscotti, I'm from the US Department of State, uh, Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. Um, and I also serve as our focal point for the Freedom Online Coalition. Thank you so, so much for this panel. I was excitedly writing so many notes, and I have so many follow-ups that I'd, I'd love to have with all of you. Um, I have a question that was sparked by some of Nicole's comments, but really just open it up to the whole panel. One of the things that I've also found is pretty consistent with the first finding that you noted about the acceptance, it seems, of this tool um, internationally, really due to the uh, fact that so many governments feel that they really don't have very many other tools to address what, again, are legitimate concerns. And um, you know, when we're going through the list that we see oftentimes in Access Now Keep It On reports of these are all the, the real reasons um, that an internet shutdown might be happening, I think one of the reasons that's often cited as a, I can't believe that's a reason, is um, to prevent cheating. And so, um, I, I am a little bit curious, just across the board, you know, what are some of the solutions that folks have been thinking about to address what is um, really just seen like as a um, institutional frameworks and sort of like f f structural issues within governments that lead them to be unable to address some of these, again, legitimate concerns that are happening within the country and then turning to the internet to then just bluntly just use that to, to try to address everything and then creating so many other additional um, uh, concerns that just build on top of the original legitimate concerns. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. A really important point there about practical alternatives of policymakers. If I may, you, you implied, you suggested Nikki, Nicole had uh, touched on some of these points. I might ask Nicole, uh, online, if you want to uh, come in on Nikki's uh, question, over to you, Nicole. Sure, no, no, thanks for that, Nikki. I mean, I think we see it at both levels, and maybe Andrea wants to also come in with what he's seeing in the Congo, because I think we do see it with policymakers not understanding, and I think it's particularly in markets that are peripheral to the large tech companies. So here, you know, I'm not speaking about Kenya, I'm speaking about the Central African Republic, I'm speaking to some degree about Ethiopia, but um, you know the, where they don't have the same channels, the same lines open. They don't have embassies in Silicon Valley like Germany does. You know, like it's just a very different environment and relationship with these companies, and so they're also not sure how to engage with them. Um, and I think it's not only the at the level of the companies, but it's also an understanding about technology. It's an understanding about what other tools they have, how else they can deal with it. Um, other than shutting down the internet. And I think we also, and I think what is very concerning, and this is some research that, as I mentioned, I just returned from, from Ethiopia, and we were, we've were we been doing long-standing um, research in Awasa and Shashamani, which are two conflict-affected regions, looking at how communities there 
are engaging with internet shutdowns and how they see the impact of internet shutdowns. And we have seen there that there is an acceptance of these internet shutdowns because people are so fed up with the, with the content that they're receiving online, with the massive amounts of online hate speech, with the incitement to violence, and they're also experiencing violence on the ground. So they're just saying, you know, to, and I'm putting it very crudely, our findings are more nuanced than this, but in the interest of like 10 seconds, um, you know, they're finding that, that there aren't any other alternatives, so they'd rather not be exposed to this, what they see as inciting real world violence, and they'd rather just have it shut off. Great, thank you for that. Um, I see some more hands up in the room. We've got two speakers. If, if the lady at the microphone could come in, and then afterwards, the gentleman here, if you could go after, we'll take these two questions uh, uh, together in a bunch. So over to you. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I'm Sally Wentworth, I'm from the Internet Society, and I wanna thank you for this, this great panel. Learned a lot, um, a lot of things to be concerned about. Um, we at the Internet Society, we are a more um, technical organization, and we've thought hard about what, what role we can play to support the work that many of you are trying to do um, to support freedom and to support um, democracy and free flow of information. And, and where we stand is we like to look at it from you know, what do we see in the internet? And is there information that we can see on the internet about shutdowns, about data flows, about cross-border connectivity, and make that information available in sort of digestible ways that you all can use in your advocacy um, and, and, um, and, and promotion of democracy and, and free elections. Um, Sarah, I was particularly um, struck by your comment of putting this in a broader context of what is the impact, not just in the immediate term with respect to the election, but what does this do, uh, you know, ongoing shutdowns, what does that do for a country's economy, right? If they, if we see governments saying, we want to be, you know, an online economy, we want to be a digital marketplace, we want to have all these opportunities, but there's no reliability of connectivity, that makes a very difficult investment climate. And so that's some of what we're trying to do. We have a tool called Pulse, a little bit of shameless plug, but really what we're trying to do is create resources that are useful for, for activists that are doing this, this kind of important work. So I want to thank you for that and, um, and you know, express our support and willingness to, to be helpful in this. Thank you so much. I'll take the two further questions in the room in the bunch, and then we've got a hand up in the virtual room as well, and then we'll do one final round of reactions from the panel. But uh, over to yourself. Hi, Jamil. I'm a, I'm a barrister, but I'm also a policy uh, counsel for many of the tech companies in Pakistan. And uh, one of the things I found very effective uh, was to actually run a timer, a clock, that shows how money is being lost every time, you know. And it worked really well with ministers and other policy uh, folks as well. My, my, my question really is to Nicole. Um, I completely understand there are certain things we're also seeing in countries like Pakistan where there's uh, religious ceremonies or religious uh, days where there could be violence, very serious violence. And so handling the internet uh, in some ways becomes important. And if they don't know what to do, they will shut it down. That's what's happening every single time. My concern is that while we legitimize that, and we said that's a concern, from what I'm hearing constantly in this room has been this sort of an idea that you know, there are actually good reasons. I'm concerned about certain governments, they might not be in Central Africa, for instance, but in other places who might actually take heed from this and say, wonderful, we have people who agree with us. So I'd just like to sort of make sure that we balance that out a little bit. Thank you so much. Thank you, a really good point there. Uh, and last but not least, over to you, sir. Thank you, thank you. Le let me introduce myself. Uh, this is Ganesh Pandey. I work for the government of Nepal in the Prime Minister office. Uh, while talking about the free and fair election and internet, right now we focus only on the uh, internet shutdown and uh, something else, but we should not forget. Free and, free and fair election needs comprehensive approach. There is a government, there is the internet service provider, there, is a, there are political parties, and there are also the uh, citizens. So sometimes government intentionally or purposefully controls the media and the internet to get the, some vested interest or hide the information in that way how we can make the government accountable. Sometimes the public 
make the criticize of the some of the leader or the candidate of the elections. If that is disinformation within one hour, it is spread so fastly that the image or the trust of that leader goes down immediately. And we don't have the access to the internet service provider to control or to check or restrict that uh, disinformation or the disfame of that, that, that is the false, false information. So how the internet service providers, we can make responsible through the use of AI or any tools so that such kind of disinformation should not be spread in the social media or something else. And the second thing is that uh, how government can make, can how we can make the government more accountable and responsive through the use of uh, digital technology. This is also very important. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Some really important reflections from a policymaker's perspective. Um, I'm going to ask the panel to uh, come in. I'll introduce you uh, and ask you to come in. But first, to come in is I think we have Andrea, one of our speakers online, who would like to come in. So, uh, and Andrea, did you want to come in on any of those points or yeah, another yeah, point? Yeah, thank you. So, uh, in the case of Congo, it was Sasufi who reached out to Meta to have a kind of task force on the election, and it's not that we we are trying to justify the reason of the government. We are identifying a pain. The pain is there is hate speech from opposition and government. There is misinformation from every side. So as a civil society organization, we need to be the referee in the middle ground. And if we can, as a takeaway for the group, have more civil society organization reaching to those big corporations and doing this online uh, uh, moderation in the local level, because those companies won't do it themselves. We need to push them. And by doing so, we will erase that argument of a government that internet means violence, because we will have this local civil society working against the hate speech, working against the incitement to violence. And if we are more of us doing that work, the government w won't have this legitimate argument to say, oh, nobody is doing that work, so we have to shut down the internet. This is our way to address that specific problem. Thank you, Andre. That, I think that addresses one of the points made just now about how to engage with uh, internet providers and content uh, platforms. But uh, I think we had a question about from the Internet Society around data and economy and making that argument. Maybe if I could ask Sarah to, to respond to that. And then we had a comment made from our colleague based in Pakistan about the dangers of potentially giving some arguments to those states who don't have, put, put bluntly, the best of intention in this area and the unwitting um, sort of power we might hand over to them. Maybe I can ask Felicia to respond to that. So Sarah and then Felicia. Yeah, all I would say is thank you to the Internet Society. I know that there's been a lot of work being done uh, lately, especially um, through the discussions uh, from the Summit for Democracy. Um, you know, the platform that's come out of that or that's been strengthened through that and also the cost of Internet shutdown. Well, that's a different title. Um, <laughs> but that that tool, I think, is, is really critical. Um, and it's really getting it into more hands and how do we um, make sure that that data is accurate or reflects the local context because that's the other situation that we face if we're going in and speaking to a particular policymaker, they wanna make sure that it, it reflects their situation and their context. Um, and I think maybe, as I said, my main point is this needs, these conversations, this work needs to start now, uh, particularly for the elections coming up. Um, how do we, you know, I think sitting down and collaborating and figuring out what data you have, what data you have, um, and that we have from on the ground, and how do we, this is still my question, is how can we, you know, have this collaboration point in advance to make sure that we're all sharing the information that we're collecting and working with the right, whether it's policymakers, whether it's civil society, or ISPs, or the tech platforms, or strategic litigators, all of these 
components or international, you know, FOC is like this is very critical for, um, you know, raising the alarm and all of this data comes together to make the case. And so, thank you for that. <laughs> I'm not sure what the qu I'm not sure if I'm answering this particular question, but I just want to note that the importance of that platform and how much we we value it. Thank you. Over to you, Felicia. Um, yes. Yeah. So for us, um, I like keep it on coalition campaign. We haven't seen any evidence of shutdowns contributing to resolving crises that governments tend to cite. Um, when you shut down the internet during conflict um, in response to dangerous con um, content being flagged online, it only escalates the, um, the crisis. It endangers more people. It provides an opportunity for governments and perpetrators to actually commit heinous crimes against people with impunity. And so for us, we, we believe that what needs to be done is that, yes, there is violence content on platforms. Big tech companies need to be responsible in taking down violent content or hateful content or dangerous content in order to keep people safe. And so um, I just want to emphasize that um, the Keep It On Coalition denounces all forms of shutdowns. We haven't seen shutdowns as a solution to any form of violence anywhere around the world. And if anything, what shutdowns do is that, as I said, it provides an opportunity for governments, warring parties to perpetrate heinous crimes against people around the world. And so I just want to make this um, 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 very clear on behalf of the Keep It On Coalition. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're really reaching the end of it. I've got the unenviable task of trying to sum this up in about a minute or two. Um, Three very quick points from me. Firstly, a big thanks to our speakers for coming in and setting out this very complicated issue for us. Uh, and also a big thank you to all of you, both online and in the room, for engaging in this. Uh, secondly, I think for me, this is a reminder of the importance from a principles-based perspective. Namely, internet shutdowns pose a massive threat to not only the ability to exercise offline rights online, but they also pose a threat to the wider democratic fabric of society, and also they pose significant economic costs to societies as well. Finally, and the third more positive hope I want to end on is to say that there's a lot of good intentions I'm hearing across this discussion about trying to support policymakers where they might not have the capacity but they have the intent to address these issues but also recognizing that we should stand firm in the face of those who actually don't have the best of intentions here and next year we potentially have the fate of two billion people in about 50 or so elections to consider and the need to stand up for that on a norms-based basis in that regard, I really want to remind everyone of the FOC statement that we launched today. That's a start about two weeks ago <coughs> as part of the UNESCO International Day for Universal Access Information. There's an Oxford statement also I'd like to bring your attention to, I hope it will be on screen, which highlights the comprehensive impact of these issues together. And finally, we hope through the FOC and the Task Force Internet Shutdowns we can, through a multi-stakeholder approach, bring all the expertise together, the data together, to come up with some practical measures to try and address the significant challenges that not only happening today, but also we'll be facing collectively next year as well. So thanks again to all our speakers and to all of you for this session.